This is the Platinum Podcast. Welcome to the Platinum Podcast, mate. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, cool. we, should, we just jump straight in. We might as well carry on this conversation. Let's oh. enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, like I used to do that with exactly the same thing with weed. I would like smoke it mm. and I wouldn't, I'd either smoke or I wouldn't smoke. So I'd stop smoking for a while because I was getting really brain dead and I realized that I was not functional anymore. And then after like a month of not smoking, I'd be like, okay, well, let's have a little joint now, see what happens. And I'd be really creative. I'd get loads of stuff done. I'd be like, oh, this is fantastic. I'm good. And then I'd be like, oh, I might as well smoke tomorrow as well because I've got so much stuff done. I'm really productive. And I'd do that. And then by about day four, I'm sat on the sofa eating mini rolls and what's it. And I've achieved absolutely nothing. And it was just not good for me. <laughs> At least you're catching up on day four, bro. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, but the problem is by day four, and then I, I continue into about day 20. And then before I know I'm at that stage again, where I really need to stop smoking weed because I'm getting really brain dead. Mm. It's not a good space. Mm. Last time I saw you, as it happened, on that note, <laughs> on that la- note, last time I saw you, you were walking around with a beer bong, offering it to me, and I was getting PTSD just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> what was coming up for you when the beer bong came out? Oh God, I was I was just getting really bad flashbacks of really horrible times of when I used to be a drunken degenerate. Yeah. It was it was a really unpleasant experience. Well, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't calling you a person. <laughs> to preface to preface the conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah. We were talking about like now and then when you feel like it's necessary to blow off some steam. And for me, going out and drinking in some of the communities I'm in, sometimes it is demonized and it's considered like just absolutely no go. But then for me, sometimes the conversation we're having before is (laughs) I think it's okay sometimes because sometimes I can feel really great after it, but it is very easy to slip into that and justify it and keep doing that. And that's like a chance for you to check in and just be like, is this really what I want to be doing? Like, is this taking me further towards where I want to be going? So, yeah. I always question that one because mm. I, I get that feeling. And this is literally a space I've been in recently as well. We were just talking about being under loads of stress and pressures from work and like being able to constructively pull back and give yourself that space. My go-to would always be, I deserve a drink now. I've mm. had a really stressful time. I need to blow off steam. But now I look at it more as, or at least I try to look at it as, okay, this is what's happening for me. This is what it's bringing up. How do I deal with this in a more healthy way? Mm. How do you deal with it in a more healthy way these days? For me, it's exercise. Yeah, It's always been exercise. Um, and it's not like the cliche answer of like, to sit with a meditation, breath work, which I feel like a lot of people lean on. For me, I just like, I genuinely just lean on exercise and fitness. Mm-hmm. It's the ability for me to unplug and just focus solely on me. And that's sometimes where my best creative ideas come up. Like caffeinated in the gym, shit flows. <laughs> my man, Joe okay. has a coffee. Um, unfortunately, I just, I had a fallen soldier on the scooter on the way here and lost mine. Um, but yeah, like the, the biggest thing for me in that is I come from a narrative that was championed to go and do that. Like men around me were championed to go and get wasted, go and get lit. Like how many girls did you pull that night? No one's championing like, yo, you're crushing monogamy. Like, keep it up, bro. <laughs> how many years? Four years? Go you. <laughs> nice. You didn't lie to your girlfriend <laughs> this week? Well done, you. So I come from a world where like who was the most blackout was championed on for the next week. And I walked away from many friendship groups within that. And it's tough to do that, man. Like I know you've probably done that. Anyone that's come over to Bali has, you know, physically walked away from a friendship group. And it's tough, man, because there's a lot of judgment and shame that can come with that. And there's a lot of self-inquiry of like who I really am and what I'm really doing. Yeah, Yeah. I love that you've gone straight into that space. We started Mm. off with in the recklessness of the madness. Yes. And we're actually taking it to the real value that there is in that space. Like like you said, I've definitely been that person. I was an absolute degenerate for many, many years. Mm it's really hard to pull yourself out of that. Um, and I know that a lot of people listen to this right now. There's probably a lot of people that are still getting pulled into that on a weekly basis by yeah. their friends, by the people that surround them. What did you, what was that light bulb moment for you that kind of made you realize that you need to pull yourself out of that situation? For me, it was when I really took inventory of the people around me and really checked in with what they were doing with their time um, and where they were going and what, like for me, it was it was looking at the actions and the results. So like, what are you doing right now and what's the result you're getting for that? And I came from, like I mentioned before, a society and narrative that would champion, champion on all the things I didn't 
I didn't realize at the time I didn't want to do them because it was fun. It was fun to just go out and not care like what was going to happen tomorrow or next week and not have a plan. Like it's, it's so easy to just know responsibility for all of that. But when I really checked in of the people around me, like there's a famous quote, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And also like it, that touches back on like you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And I don't want to throw shade on anyone because I was doing that exact thing at that time. And I truly believe you can never really, you can never truly push someone into a direction that you want them to go. They need to like learn it themselves. So for me, I just kind of cut ties with that. Mm -hmm. I was like, every time there was a gathering, people going out, drinking, I was like, nah, I'm just, I'm busy tonight. I'm not doing much. And the reality is you're gonna, you're gonna cut, you're gonna cop a bit of hate from that. And that's just, that's within the culture of being a man, I feel. Cause a lot of times when you step up, other people look at you like, they know internally they should be doing something more and something different. But by you doing that, it's holding up a mirror for them. And they take that like, oh, like, what, what do you fucking mean? You're better than me, you're not gonna come out? Like, you're better than drinking? you like, it's, That's how you feel, bro. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was a funny turning point. And over my life, I've stepped away from many friendship groups um, because the reality for me was like, when I really got to know myself better, that isn't who I was or what I wanted to be. In saying that, I've had a few friends in and out of my life throughout that, that now we're consistently as tight as ever because we're both up to similar shit, man. Yeah, I love that. I've had similar th similar things. Like when I first started pulling away, there's all about, oh, what are you doing? Oh, do you think you're better? Like what's all this kind of little journey you're going on? Mm. And it stays like that for a little while. And then like a couple of years down the line, then the narrative started changing a little bit and there's a little bit more curiosity. So what is this life that you're living? What's mm. it all about? And they start to, I think once the ego kind of moves a little bit out of the way, then you can come from a different place. And then all of a sudden you reconnect in a, mm. in a, in a really amazing way. Um, what would you? What advice would you really give to people that are in that space, really try it, they, they're aware that they don't like their scenario, they don't like the environment they're in, they love the people they're around, that's the thing, is that mm. you love these people, they're your close friends, right? Mm. How do you start to pull away? What advice would you give people to make that happen? There's an internal pull that we all have and it's a conversation like I thought it was just like me being full of ego when I was younger that I always thought I was going to do something different and bigger with my life but the reality was like I am now um to be able to really check in with that and know when it's your ego talking and when your friends talking and when it's what you really want to do um I could I could say so many things to this but I'm just thinking back truly to like what I done I, I looked at people that were doing the things I wanted to do. I found people online that already succeeded in that. And I would grab bits and pieces from like, there's certain fitness guys I would follow online and then certain traders online and then certain motivational speakers. And like, I'd see all these aspects of their life. Like, what are they doing in this field? And I just started to step into that. Um, it's, it's, it truly is that simple. Like the reason what we do at Yogi Lab is like for me, it's giving people the shit I wish I fucking learned in school. I feel like that's the same for you guys as well. Like Exactly that. When the fuck have I need to use algebra since I've less, left school? Ugh. Like maybe yes, if that's the career you've stepped into or whatever. But for me, like no one taught me how to manage anxiety, to save money, to fucking sign, a, sign and understand a contract and buy a house. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't know about all of that. Um, mm. So yeah, find people that are already doing what you want to do. Yeah, God and bless that algebra. Yeah, a couple of guys I work with, like one of my biggest things is, and how I got my videography business and everything else off the ground is by reaching out to people, like literally offering your services for free. When I first picked up a camera within three months, I was making double the income I was as a qualified tradesman. I used to do bathroom and, uh, bathroom and house renovations for seven, eight years uh, on the tools, on the job sites and that's also a narrative I didn't want to live out. I was looking at 40 year old men wanting to work on Saturday and Sunday so they didn't spend time with their kids or wife. And it was laughed about and I was always quiet. And then when they saw me on podcasts and speaking, they're like, oh, like what you said, like you talk? I was like, yeah, I just didn't want to like fucking engage in that conversation, man. <laughs> um, I don't want that. I wanted something different. Uh, it, it wasn't, I just didn't want to talk to you. That was based on the bottom line. Yeah, I, didn't, I yeah. just couldn't be fucked. That's a nice way of saying yeah, that, no. man. That's very um, considerate of you, very polite. <laughs> I think the one thing I just missed them was like some of the guys I've worked with, I've genuinely just said to them like, you want to do that? 
go reach out to someone like a kid I worked with back in Adelaide. He wanted to be this top used car salesman. Uh, sorry, not used car, car salesman. And for me, I was like, that might be what you want. You might like the idea of it until you try it. But it's until you put the shoe on, you never really know if it fits. So I was like, okay, cool, do it. How are you going to do that? Uh, I'm not sure I might go study. I'm like, no, 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 right now, today, reach out to five people. Just Google top salesman in your state. Reach out to them. Ask to come work for them for a week or two. Within two weeks, he was working at Ferrari for two weeks. Uh, he'd done two-week internship. And then he came back. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, you could spend five years wanting to do that. And then you get there or you go to the university degree or whatever. And then the day you do it, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. I don't want to do this. Everyone has it so back to front. It's the same with mm. university, which is something that pissed me off. Like you would pay nine grand a year or whatever you pay for it, depending on what country you're in. You study, you might do it for three, four years. You get out the other end and you have no idea if you actually like the day-to-day -day job. Mm. You just have this idea of something that you want to do. You mm. have the idea of being a doctor or being a psychologist, or whatever the hell it is you want to do. You don't know what the day-to-day -day is. You don't know whether you really enjoy that. Mm. Even more so, even a bigger problem is you might be, even if you would like it at that age, you might change so much within those three or four years that the person that now does the job is completely different and incompatible with it. Mm. It's insane. And I think we, we don't take into account how adaptable we are as human beings. I think what you touched on there is really, really powerful for people because people, I think people are kind of averse to just kind of doing something for free because they see it as they're not getting paid in terms of money. Mm. but they are getting paid in terms of education, in terms of experience, and that's where the true value is. I would love to touch on how you made that transition. So you've gone from being on a building site to suddenly deciding, I wanna be a videographer. What did you do? Tell me what your next steps were. I've done a lot of things on that way. Does um, it involve beer bongs? There were some on there the were. way. Look, to be honest, I'm just really good at them. So I, like, <laughs> I like to bring it out now and then. It's a skill set. I mean, <laughs> you don't need it anymore, but it's still there if you it's ever there. need to whip it it's out. It's there if I ever, ever need to lean on it. Yeah. Um, there was a lot in between that. When I was uh, 21, I, I was working, I worked as a dishy, hydro ceramic technician as my chef. Had my job title. I was like, that's so dope. Um, so I, I was washing dishes worked up to being a waiter and then left there to work at the casino. And I was like, cool, the casino, like this is where I wanna be, like this is where all the big stuff happens. Bro, I rocked up to my job interview in a suit at 21 years old, black tie, black suit, shoes, and I walked into the role, cause I applied for like 10 jobs. I didn't know what I was getting. I walked in and he was like, oh, like you're, I, I, the interview I was there for was working behind the bar. So I got the job. Um, and then throughout that time, I. I fell into the trap of complacency. Like my dad has been on the building sites for 30, 40 years. Tyler, plaster, bricklayer, you name it. Um, he's an old wog. You know, he, him and the Italians, like they've been, they've been doing that game for a long time. So when I stepped into that, I just stepped into it because it was offered to me. Like I don't want to be in the casino anymore. I, I hated the little bitchiness and underhandedness that people were trying to climb to the top in that. So when I stepped into the building industry, it was just because my dad done it. And I was there for eight years. And I could see how it was comfortable. I earned good money. I worked long hours, but I earned good money. But there was nothing beyond that. So in that eight years, I, I never walked away from that job, but I tried seven, eight different business models. I tried email marketing, um, crypto, high school speaking, um, network marketing, uh, importing and distributing products, um, creating my own tiling tools, importing them, drop shipping. Like I tried a bunch of shit, man. <laughs> And for me, when I really checked in with myself, like what I want to do every single day, whether I get paid for it or not, when I wake up, I just want to step in my creativity. I want to start shooting video, photo, like I just, that was a part of me that lay dormant for so long. And things like that, I feel like they atrophy after time and they die off. When I stepped into that, like I started to enjoy so much shit. And the high school speaking I'd done for a short period of time as well was like, it excited me but it wasn't my thing. And I really judged myself for that. I was going into schools, speaking to kids on self and emotional awareness, bullying, and kids were crying, breaking down, like my IG DMs were lighting up and I was driving away from the school. I'm like, I'm not like, I'm not ecstatic and excited by this. And I'm like, fuck, am I a bad person? Am I a bad person that I'm like, ch like changing kids' lives? I, I I'm not a big fan of that term, but 
showing them and giving them permission to show up differently at school and for their friends. And I was like, I'm a bad person for not doing this. But it's just like, it just wasn't what lit me up at the time. I just wanted to create. I wanted to step into that. So, and this is a tangible thing I fucking love to share. This is something I share with a lot of my clients as well. For me to get the high school speaking off the ground from never ever speaking in a high school to getting booked within a couple of weeks, for me to pick up a camera and never be paid for a shoot to be paid three times what I was paid within a couple of months was something I employed in my life called three by three by three. And it's super simple when you hear it. You'll be like, what? I'm ready. That's, Give ready? it to me. I'm excited. Okay. You've lured me in. I want to know. It's three new contacts every single day in the field you're in. So for me, an example, a tangible thing for high school speaking was reaching out to three new schools a day. Simple. Videography, reaching out, reaching out to three people, you know, try to leverage someone with a big following or influence online or a business that you genuinely just want to create for. Um, so I'd reach out to three new people every day, three follow-ups every day. At first, on day two, you've only got three people to follow up with. Maybe not straight away on day two, bring that in later, but this compounds over time. You guys all understand compound interest. That's like, that's the, one of the games you're in. The last one, which doesn't sound, might sound like the most important, but to some people it doesn't, is it's three pouring of love into people every single day. Without, without there's, no, there's no game behind it. There's no intention to get something back. It's just like that friend in school you haven't spoken to for eight, nine years, shoot him a message and talk about that one time when you're at a house party or like in school when you fucked around and like you appreciated his friendship and that time in life. When I'd done that every single day for 30 days, everything changed. It put me in a space of love and giving, but I also had this like this list I was building of people I'd reached out to and made a con um, contact with. Maybe on day one, they don't wanna shoot a video with me, but they see some other videos I've shot and then on day 30, they're hitting me up. They're like, oh, I remember when you reached out to me then. So that's something like, I love tangible things. Whenever I listen to podcasts or anything, and or I'm on YouTube, I'm like, what's something I can do right fucking now? Like all this other thing up in the air and mindset. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I love it. But like, I'm go, go, go. I want to do something right now. So that's something I employed and um, I fucking love it, man. It changed everything for me. Oh, I think that's huge. I think yeah. that's absolutely huge. I love what you did there. Like you pulled it out of the ether. Everyone talks about like spreading a little bit of love, being nice to yeah. people, you know, it's all that kind of thing. But just have a simple strategy and that's very time efficient. Three people a day. Everybody listening to this right now can do exactly that. Yeah. Tell me about the change that I had. Tell me about like what started happening. Tell me about how it made you feel as a human being just going through that process. Just the appreciation. I was coming from, and like you say, how people pull things out of the ether. It's like, be thankful for breathing. Be thankful for the sunshine. I'm like, <laughs> that shit does not land for me. <laughs> like I find it really hard to sit there and be thankful for the sun sunshine. Like I feel like it just is. Um, it put me in just a different space, man. And I didn't even notice it until four or five days in. Where like my housemate at the time, um, a really good friend of mine, Ellie back at home, she was like, you're just like, you're just showing up different in like conversations when you get home from work, like everything you do. And when I got that feedback, I hadn't even realized it wasn't my intention to become a nicer person from this. I just like, it just felt great at the time. So I kept doing it. Beautiful. That's some so solid, solid advice. Yeah. So this is what you did for the videography side of things, right? This you is what said. I done for the high school speaking. Okay. This is what I done for the videography. And this is what I done when I landed in Bali. Yeah. I came out of Bali, I knew no one. And I just started, I like remembered, I was like, oh yeah, I used to do that thing. I'm gonna do that again. And then um, within a couple of months, I met the boys from Yogi Lab and come on board as a partner. Uh, you, you're the final member. You're the final man from the group. Yes, you guys have had everyone on. I've had absolutely <laughs> everybody from Yogi Lab. I've got to say, your content is absolutely incredible. Like, I, I love it. If, if I didn't like everybody part of Yogi Lab as much, I'd definitely be trying to undercut them and certainly offer a deal across the table for your services. <laughs> we, we, we could use that. <laughs> What does that pro what does the creative process look like for you? The creative process looked like for me mm. within Yogi Lab or like my own kind of in general. I'm I'm very curious for that because this is uh, because you, you touched on creativity um, and how it's kind of something that if not nurtured like remains dormant inside of you. Mm. And that's something that's massively resonant for me. So it, I'm very curious about it. It's something I had to nurture. For many years, I thought I wasn't creative because I didn't live in a world where I nurtured that side of myself. Yeah. And then when I started to, creativity started coming through me and then I became a creator. Yeah. I'd love to know what the process is like for you. Um, one, when you nurture it in the early stages, when you're not as aware of it. And mm. two, how you tap into that creative flow in normal life. Mm. 
in the early stages, man, it was, I was getting into a flow state and I didn't even realize. Like I was on the tools 50 hours a week and I was coming home, like I was going straight from work to the gym, come home, shower off on my computer. And I'd sit there till 11, 12, sometimes one, if I was really in a flow, like, you know, when you like, when you're, you're riding or whatever it is you're doing, it just comes out and there's no, there's no off switch. And then you go, go, go. And you're like, okay, cool. I'm done now. That was pretty much what it was like, man. Like I was sitting there <laughs> and anyone starting a new skill, like it's going to take a while. The first ever video I edited was for a fitness model that went for 45 seconds and it probably took me nine hours. <laughs> um, I was YouTube tutorial, make the edit, YouTube tutorial, make the cut. Um, so for me, it was just, I just, I just wanted to do it. And I just sat down and got stuck straight in. Now, if I'm going to be really honest right now, it's something I feel like I've lost a bit of myself because I don't do it as much. Like before this podcast, we were talking about scheduling time in to really decompress and whatever that decompress looks like. For me, it's playing basketball. For someone else, it could be meditation. It could be writing, drawing, whatever that is. And right now, I just don't do enough of that. Like I'm creating content every single day. And sometimes when I get home, I'm like, I'm not sure if I've got the capacity to create for myself. So to be genuine honest right now, I'm not doing it anywhere near as much as I want to. Yeah, that, that interests me as well because I've I've had this conversation with the guys. Obviously, we're, we're running a big company here. We've got all of that side of things, all the administrative tasks and the orchestration. And then a main major role for me is doing podcasts, creating content, etc. And it's really difficult for me to switch between being really heady and like in these kind of organization structural tasks and then trying to transition into something creative because my brain just doesn't work that way. Yeah. I really need to find a way to flip that switch quicker because mm. I know that I'd be more productive. I'll, I'll find myself just, if I'm going from structural stuff to then trying to be creative, I'll be sat there for ages, like nothing's switching on here. Can't really join the dots. I can't enter the ether. I'm mm. still stuck down here on planet earth. What do you do? Other, I mean, obviously you need that deep compression day, but is there anything else you can do to bring that, bring that back in? When you're struggling to like, kick things off in a creative Yeah, just get back aspect. into that creative space again, like when you've been too in the structural stuff. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's such a masculine answer. It's like just doing it, like <laughs> taking control and doing it. And I know that's might not be the answer you want to hear, but when there's a, when there's a video, I, like, I really have resistance to do an edit. I open the project up, I airplane mode everything else, and I'm just like, okay, what do we start with? Yeah. For anyone who edits videos knows those first few frames, if you're making a promo or something, like, can take longer than the rest of the video. The rest of the video can flow after that. So it's like, I think uh, it's Stephen Pressfield, War on Art speaks about this, how an amateur waits for inspiration, a professional something, something. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher that quote. Probably takes, goes and gets it. Goes yeah. and gets it, takes, yeah. takes action and then the inspiration comes with it. So the conclusion is I need to man up and get on with it is basically what you're telling me right now. <laughs> in, in, a so, round, in a yeah, roundabout yeah. way you're like Joe just fucking get on with it mate we yeah no no because I can't say that because if someone would say that to me as well I'd be like fuck off you don't get it <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand my creative process yeah, okay yeah. just just back off okay no the, the creative process brings up something for me because it's mm. like um, a big a big like a long time for me it's like drop the ego like you're not some fucking Picasso over here trying to make the world's greatest video it's like yeah. you, you've just got to do yeah, that's yeah. that's. I think that's. You get very caught up with your own. Your own head gets in the way often. You're like, oh, it needs to be perfect. Oh, this needs to be perfect. I'm I'm an absolute savage when it comes to my own videos. I can't even watch them because I'm just mm -hmm. like, I need to do this better. I'm such a perfectionist with it. Yeah. It's really hard. And like Scott and Lewis, they're like, no, it's a good video. And I'm like, nah, it's horrible. I'm sick of my face. Like absolutely sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> the the thing is, ourselves on camera photo and video is different we see ourselves different to so like everyone else man mm. i have that thing when I'm, I'm shooting portraits of people and stuff they're like oh no nah, but my hair on my nose like in this kind of here and then i'm like looking at it like what and then they'll post a photo that i'm like why would you post that like when we look at ourselves we see ourselves in a completely different light to everyone else yeah. because i feel like okay so one thing i shared recently on my instagram was i really caught myself portraying an image that i wasn't on my instagram and I've done this a couple of times where I started leaning. Bro, I was photoshopping my hairline here to like fill in a little bit. And my girlfriend, like Selena, thank you for this. But she called me out on that. She's like, you work with men and self-confidence and rediscovering who they fucking are. And you're going to sit here and do that. And I was like, well, it's just like, it's just my, it's just my hairline. She's like, no, no, you can't. And 
this turned into a bit of a thing, but like to have a partner that really calls you out on your shit, it's good. It's tough at first. And I, I've had partners in the past that have, and I just wasn't ready for that. I was like, no, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. Yeah. But like, thank God she does. She keeps me in line. We need that. Yeah, I, we do. I'm in the same boat. I, I totally get it. I think years ago, probably similar to most men, your ego is too involved. You're not ready to take that kind of criticism. You're not prepared for it. So you end up just kind of retaliating, don't you? And it just becomes like this, this is how you end up in a war. When yeah. you can get yourself to a place where you just take on feedback and you go, okay, this is coming from a place of love. You care about me. You want me to be better. Okay, fine. I know this hurts. Fine, I'll post the photo. <laughs> I'll fucking post the picture of my bad hairline. Yeah. It's okay. And, and men will work with me still. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love something about your story that really interests me because the, the creativity piece, sorry to pull it back to that, you've gone from a building site to something that's purely creative. Mm. And I feel like that's such a struggle for so many different people. There's so many people... I think it's a classic, like being on a building site is like the classic manly job. People in that industry, they're a particular way, obviously it's a stereotype, I'm probably overgeneralizing, but everybody knows people that work on the tools and there's a certain way of living, right? Yeah. To make that transition to a creative space must be really, really difficult from that environment. And I, I've got a lot of people that listen to this and a lot of friends of mine that work in those kind of environments. And they're probably under the impression that they don't have any creativity in them. And they don't even know how to tap into that or that there's even another way. And I'd love to be able to just, you drop that little nugget in there that mm. inspires them to try something else. What would that nugget be? Tough question, I know. Yeah. Because it's um, different for everyone, but. It is. For me, f for me in particularly, it was coming back to what I said before. Like, you don't know if that shoe fits unless you try it on. Yeah. So you might think, like, the amount of times I've been an armchair coach watching basketball or football or whatever it is, and I'm like, he yeah. should be doing that, he should be doing this. It's quite easy to do that in your own life. So it's like, fucking go and do it. Like, if you can talk a big game and you think you're going to be good at it, or even if you're not sure, give yourself permission to fuck up. Like, can, I can swear on this, yeah? We're pretty, we're so deep <laughs> Mate, into this. You can say whatever you <laughs> like, anything. anything. Um, give, your um, give yourself permission to fuck up. Like, like, and there's two sides to that one which i mentioned like you might think you're really good at something and you might think you're going to enjoy it until you do it and the second is like you're gonna fuck up you're gonna get shit wrong like drop the ego the first day you rocked up on a building site and you picked up a hammer and you were trying to put two befores together probably weren't great at it you probably broke some shit you may have put a nail through your hand you could have broken some tiles like whatever that is that was my building career yeah that's that's the highlight reel yeah <laughs> sorry carry on so carry it's on. like have compassion for yourself as well man mm. like i done eight different business models one of them worked out um one and a half of them worked out crypto i just got lucky i, I found a few people online they were talking some stuff i put some money in, came back oh cool i can buy a camera a mac and move to bali yeah <laughs> um so yeah it's just those things man like have compassion with yourself when you get shit wrong because yeah. you're going to and if you're not getting stuff wrong you're playing too small like if you're always nailing stuff and you're always like, you know, they say the smartest person in the room, you need to get in the new fucking room. Yeah. Um, make some mistakes and be okay with that. Yeah. And just know, know that stuff's going to come up and it's going to happen. That exploration piece is key, isn't it? Just mm. kind of being curious and just going, I'm going to try some different shit and see yeah. what happens. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care. Just, just see what happens. I've done all sorts of weird shit, especially since coming to Bali. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. So okay. Top, top three weirdest things you've done since you've been in Bali um whew, okay <laughs> i just saw scott's head for head perk up Here as, we go. as soon as I, oh this is interesting Don't wait do it <laughs> no no incriminating okay um i went to a conscious hippie sex party some would consider that weird uh for me actually it wasn't that weird uh but other people would consider that to be the case i I would love with that, if we don't even go into details, just leave that out there and people can kind of in their own head envision what would happen. Yeah, there. we'll just leave it out there. Um, yeah, so hippie sex party. Yeah. Interesting space. Um, what weird things have I done? Feel free to jump in. Cupping if balls. Cupping balls. Oh, how did I miss that one? Yeah, that was an interesting one. I went to a men's retreat. Uh, which involved... <laughs> I can see Scott's face, he's loving this. So we had to... Just because, like, get to know men in front of us and go into really weird spaces. Yeah. And one of those spaces was getting your balls out, cuffing the other man's balls, staring him into the eyes, mm. and him and asking him, "What are you about?" 
What are you on this planet for? What is your purpose? And uh, yeah, so I had another man's balls in my hand while he was telling me what he's all about. And I was like, what a guy. He's here for big things. He means it. He wants to have impact. And you know that when you're mm, cupping you that man's balls. Sure. Yeah, when you've got the big testicles things. in your hand. Yeah, they were decent size. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I was, ha I was happy with the weight of the balls. Yeah. Um, that was an interesting space. Um, anyone else got anything? I, I, I lose track I hope, of the weird shit that I do. I hope everyone's guys. enjoying this as much. Oh, as God, I'm fucking loving off. it. Sorry? Chopped your finger off. Oh, yeah, chopped my oh, finger no, off. How, how did you start that at university? How did the business fall? Oh, that's a good story. That is a good story. I mean, it's, it's weird, but it's an interesting collection of mm. activities. So I've grown since then. Okay, guys, this is back in my drinking days. So we had this, it was my friend's birthday. He was just about to turn 21 years old. Mm. Um, so we thought, let's have a little party for him. Let's do that. So had a little party, invited some people over. What had happened was it was the beginning of Corona and we didn't realize mm. that they just implemented these new regulations and they just implemented social distancing. And we weren't allowed more than six people in the house. 40, 50 people turned up at the house. Um, and then one guy had a big Instagram following and he started taking videos of it. And he was saying things like, fuck, fuck Corona, fuck this. And it went viral and it got shared all over Indonesia. And I ended up having to do a public apology. Uh, on live news, basically saying how sorry I was for what we had done. Um, at that party, I met my business partner, Lewis, and we ended up getting talking about business, different things. About five minutes after meeting him, I've decided to stab a coconut to open it. My hand has slipped down the blade and sliced my little finger open, mm. like really, really deep. I remember having a conversation with this guy and he was like, what the hell have you done to your finger, mate? And I was like, yeah, it doesn't look good, does it? It's not that good. Next thing I know, I wake up on the floor, blood everywhere. I've passed out from blood loss. I then come back to reality, decide that the best thing to do is have a whiskey because I knew that would sort me out. Carried on with the rest of the night. Um, ended up in a threesome in the pool. Um, went to bed and woke up and then just realized that I was on national news and I had to make some serious apologies. So that mm. was quite a... I would, would you consider that a... Eventful. A, it was eventful. Was it weird? <sighs> No, it it's not I weird, think. is it? Do you want another weird one or what else we got? <laughs> I'm out. I think I'm out. Done? I, yeah, I think I'm done. Does that does that tick a lot of bases? Oh, yeah, like, like, yeah, that's a that, yeah, that's yeah. that's good. All right. Good answers. Okay. Yeah. I think uh I'm gonna have to revert this back to you now, my friend. So I'd love to know what are your top three weird barley experiences. Right. Top three weird barley experiences. I haven't, I haven't dove into that much weird shit here, man. Oh come on, mate! You can't, you can't get me to out myself for sex parties, <laughs> pub, like apologising on live news and cupping a man's balls, and mm. then you just sit here and go, "Yeah, well, I once tied up my shoelaces, and uh, it wasn't particularly eventful." Fell over. After. You can't, yeah, you can't do that to me. Yeah, it's just not all right. You've got to come up with something. I had. So what? The way I first moved over here, like I wanted to start. The videography business i want to do all that but my ticket over here was a friend tagged me in a facebook post to come manage a party hostel um and i was like cool dope let's do it free food free accommodation um but then when i got here i realized i was in the bar 6 p.m till midnight six nights a week um getting the party started starting beer pong tournaments on the bar drinking that's why you're so good at beer pong yeah yeah, that could, that could be it. There was um, quite a few, a lot of hours of practice in the first month or so when I was here. And um, it was funny because that was, that was 19 year old Mikhail's dream, not 30 year old Mikhail's dream. And I learned that very quickly. The weird thing for me, like, bro, you've gone so weird that I'm really struggling to like, you've set the bar so high. Mate, I'm a weird guy. <laughs> I, I don't really know what to say. I'm a bit of a weird guy, mate. I'm very <laughs> open-minded. Um, yeah, for me, it was like, we, we got back late from um, some day drinking somewhere and we went back to work. And then my mate was like, yo, there's a party at Omnia. We've got behind the decks, we've got bottles and all that. So we like flew up there, started drinking there, came back. And um, as a lot of you guys may know, Nossies, balloons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they yeah. had balloons at the bar. And um, those things put you in a very weird state. And <laughs> I can agree. Get, get you up to some um, some really weird <laughs> shit, man. But to be honest, man, we ended up going from there. We went to a house party and I walked out the back and I was at this house party where like everyone in the pool was naked. There was like 30 people in the pool naked and I'm like... I was probably there. I was probably, <laughs> I was probably in the pool. Like, Woo! <laughs> I was like, where are we? Where are we? And um, for me, like that whole party was... Like, I was like, oh, this is so normalized in Bali. 
Like there's so much normal shit that goes on here. And I ended up, see, I'm telling this story and I'm like, it's nowhere near fucking as weird as Joe's. Sorry, um, mate, I should have gone second. I should have gone second. <laughs> I ended up standing there in front of about 10, 12 people and performing an improv comedy with three dudes I just met earlier that night for about half an hour. Did you cup anyone's balls? No cupping of balls. Um, okay. It was, and now I woke up back of the hostel, which I was working at with an ice cream half melted on my face, no wallet, no phone. I didn't know where my scooter was. The only thing I remember was driving home, not knowing where I am because I've only been here for a couple of weeks. And I stopped on my scooter to check my phone where I was and I just fell. And I fell over and I got up and like, you know, you pep talk yourself. You're like, okay, cool. Shouldn't be drink driving, but it's not that far. You've got this. Come on, Mikel, you fucking got this. You got this, bro. Drive a bit further, check the maps and fall over. <laughs> and then ended up just coming home and like, that was it, man. There's that a reason it. we don't drink. Yeah, there, there is a is. reason. Like, there is. I used to be a reckless madman. Like that, that story was like a couple of years ago now. A lot more sensible now. Hmm. But I just do mad stuff when drunk. Like any of my old friends listening to this right now, they're probably sat there thinking, you've got worse stories than this. Mm. I probably shouldn't tell those ones. Mm. Maybe they're for another day. <laughs> okay, give me some more weird shit. I'll give, I'll give you a weird one. It doesn't um, have to be barley. Just give me some... Oh, he's got one. Are you a weird one. It is is so much more PG than yours though. Um, Most are. <clears throat> one thing I was really ashamed of and like, scared to share with anyone for a big part of my life was like I was fucking scared of the dark. I couldn't watch scary movies. I'd freak out. I'd my like I'd, my heart rate would go up. I'd get hot and sweaty and like it would just fucking overwhelm me, man. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs> I started a meditation practice, 20 minutes a day for about two weeks in a row. I'd stop, do it for a week, stop, do it for a week. And one day I was sitting there in my room and I was meditating. And this is like, this is pre Bali, pre Vipassana, pre Yogi Lab. I was just kind of like figuring out as I went. And I was listening to white noise. I remember sitting there. And as I was sitting there, my heart rate went up. I got really hot, really sweaty. And you know, the, um, Dementors and Harry Potter. I felt like, no, legit. <laughs> yeah. I felt like this thing came in my room up above me. And I was like this little boy sitting on the bed and I was so fucking scared. And there was a voice in me that was like, Mikhail, open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes, fucking open your eyes right now. And there was another voice in me that's like, just stay calm. So I, I, I don't know if you can see that. I get goosebumps right now saying this. And it's sitting there saying, keep your eyes closed. You're good. You've got this. And it came, it was almost like this crescendo was building up and this thing was coming over me, over me, over me, over me. And then all of a sudden it just whoosh, cleared the whole room and the room felt a bit cold. And I sat there, I'm like, I'm not ready to come out of this just yet. So I took another like five minutes and I opened my eyes and I'm like, I have no idea what fucking just happened. And I was like, oh, how am I meant to explain this to anyone? I don't know. I have no idea what's happened. Then, and like, I'm talking about a guy who's like, 22 23 years old going walking down the a hallway in a house going to get a glass of water at night envisioning things popping out and jumping and all this kind of shit wasn't there all the time but now and then it was there and i realized it wasn't there and it was gone and that was it and no idea how it happened how it manifested what came up what went through me blah 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 but i still see that now i kind of like understand it more because like i've been I've, I've been to a few Vipassanas and I've spoken with Dave about a hundred different meditation situations. So I've got a bit more of a conceptualiza conceptualization on that, but that was pretty fucking weird for me, man. What did, what did Dave say about that? I'm curious about the um, Dementors. Dave from memory spoke about, and this is what he speaks about a lot is like internally we store complexes within mm -hmm. us and Vipassana is the art of non-reactivity. To be able to sit there, feel the sensation come up, not have aversion to it, but then not also lean in on the good sensation, stay non-reactive to it. For me, it was probably that complex was stored in me and it was just bubbling at the surface waiting to come up. And when I sat through a little bit of pain, it was the first thing to come out and release. Interesting. Mm. I like that. I mean, the whole meditation thing, it completely changed my life. Were you meditating before you got involved with the Yogi Lab guys or was it something that you picked up then? Just little bits, little Just bits and pieces. 20 yeah. minutes a day, 30, wouldn't go up beyond 30 minutes. Would never even like 
yeah, that was like oh, 30 minutes, that's a long time. And then here I am after being with the Yogi Lab for two months. They're like, yo, we're, um, we didn't go do a Vipassana in Malaysia. You want to come? I'm like, yeah, sure. What is it? They're like, oh, it's uh, 100 hours of meditation. I'm like, like how many weeks? Like 10 days. I'm like, and like, I know the mass. Like, I understand the mass, but you know, when you still like hear something, you're like, wait, wait. So how long a day? 10 hours a day for 10 days. I'm like, what do you, like, what do you do? Like, yeah. So. When, when is the next one? Uh, because Dave's got a Vipassana coming up, right? Mm. There is a Yogi Lab one. So yeah, we're I hosting in. one in July Yeah, at the Astana. Um, Dave's in China right now. I'm not sure if he'll be back to run it, but we will be running a, um, an on-site one there. But we also run them every month online from the 11th to the 22nd. Tell people about that because this is this is such insane value. I'm going to have to yeah. give this like a little a big up before we go into yeah. this, but Vipassana is unbelievable meditation is unbelievable and if you've yeah. tried many times as many of us have to kind of build up a routine it's really hard because you don't get the benefits straight away so you have to consistently do it and not really see the benefits and then after a while it sets in and you can never envision your life without it yeah this opportunity to be able to do this online with someone as high level as dave is mm. a huge value let alone do it for free mm. i cannot big this up enough how much this could potentially change your life so yeah, yeah. please tell everyone a little bit about what, that what is the what is the so it's a meditation technique. So it's a type of meditation. Yeah. Right? Oh, you yeah. probably give a far more condensed explanation of what that is. Yeah. Um, Vipass like how I kind of mentioned before, Vipassana meditation is the ability to sit there and stay non-reactive. You're not... Well, it starts off as anapana. Anapana is just bringing sensation, uh, bringing awareness to the sensation of the breath in through the nose on the upper lip. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing in the first few days on a 10 day retreat to give you a quick summary on the first four, four days, three to four days, we're just focusing the awareness here. Mm -hmm. And when you really start to sharpen and focus the awareness there, that's when you can start stepping into the Vipassana technique. The Vipassana technique is essentially scanning your whole body from top to bottom. And we'll start at the top of the head. We'll work down through the arms, back up, down through the arm, through the chest, down through the feet, back up. And you flow through. And essentially, as you go through, you'll notice there's parts in your body where you're storing something. Feels hot, feels tight, feels rock solid, feels cold, feels super painful, sharp pain, dull pain, whatever it is. And the belief is that we store trauma and everything we've been through and these complexes and these stories we create about, about ourselves and the body armor we wear as our personalities within us. And then as you can sit through the pain, bro, you... You can sit in this and revisit every single moment in your life. Like I was, I, I got thrown back to when I was in reception and I pushed some girl off a little like um, stairs and she landed on the back of her head and I was just like, what the fuck? Like what? You passed that, it. That, that, oh, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I, I give myself so much like, come on, like, I was like four and I we probably had a crush on her or something. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing what we store within our bodies and the weirdest things for me has probably come from meditation, the things I've been able to release and process. And like, I got some weird shit that happened to me at some retreat centers. And I didn't, I didn't even be able, I couldn't conceptualize it until like a year later. And that's the thing, like you can have things come up that it's not until one month, two months, six months later where you're like, oh, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, we run one of those things. That was a great explanation, by the way. I'm so glad I passed that one over to you. I was gonna say, yeah, it's a bit of meditation, you do some body scan and you feel some stuff. Far more comprehensive. Yeah, like so uh, 10 days from the 11th to the 22nd. Dave is an absolute meditation expert. And he's he's the one person, one meditation, I haven't met many meditation teachers to be completely honest, but a lot of them speak in, like, like you said, pulling stuff out of the ether. And it's kind of like generalized comments and sayings that are cliche and you hear it everywhere. Just yeah. be you and step into the bigger version of you. Like, what, what the fuck does that even mean? Yeah. Like he... he Makes, sat there with your hammer and that like what the fuck are you yeah. talking about i'm trying to fucking put this hinge on mate. <laughs> dave pulls apart some of the most complex um theories and beliefs and spiritual like you name it um he can condense it into a couple of sentences that is just something you can actually understand and that's what i really love about it mm. um having him leading it is it's a game changer because We've been, I've been to four Vipassana retreats, three overseas, and I get it. Like it's the Goenka system. So the, one of the main guys in India who brought it and um, brought it, like brought life back into this practice, all the teachers are taught to answer questions in a certain way. It's like when you ask like, 
oh, my feet hurt when I'm sitting here. They're like, mm, feel that and just don't react to it. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but like, why is my ankle, why is my right ankle hurting? They're like, mm, like I said, just notice the pain, feel the sensation. <laughs> I'm like, do you even know what you're talking about? <laughs> like, <laughs> Did you suffer a head injury yeah. at some point? Are you going to help me or not? <laughs> yeah, so um, it's really cool to have that. And he's one person who's taken meditation and brought it into the business world and has become a multimillionaire because of it and does shit that he fucking loves doing in life. He's not just making big money, he's making a big impact as well. So every month we do that online and sit at home, turn all your shit off and plug in. And 10 days sounds like a long time, but the reality isn't. For some of the shit that I've gone through in that 10 days, like I'll do another one again at some stage when I've got more time. Mm. <laughs> I'm sometimes, um, I really contradict myself. Yeah. But yeah, honestly, take the time, drop in for that 10 days because you'll never know what can come from the other side of that. Yeah, I, it's a big thing for me. I know I did so, I think it was like five days I did when I was in Thailand with a Vipassana retreat. I would say Vipassana. Dave says Vipassana. What, what, what's well, am I bro, wrong? When I when I came over from Australia, I used to call it Vipassana. Vipassana. Oh. Like, okay, well, at least I'm doing better yeah, than that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stick with Vipassana. Mm. Feels all right for me. Uh, Dave, don't kill me. Um, yeah, I am I feel really cool to do it. So I did it before. It was great. I saw the benefits. I was there for like four or five days. After like day three, I dropped right in. I was like, wow. At first, you think you're going to be bored and stuff. The first mm. few days, you're like missing things. And then after that, it disappears. And then you reach like a place of solitude and like quiet. And I felt it felt like a spa, like a six star spa for my brain. Mm. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Mm. And then I never wanted it to end. Unfortunately, I had to fly back to the UK for business. I feel hugely called to do it soon. So heads up, platinum guys. I would love to be able to take 10 days off where I don't talk to anyone. 10 days of retreat, how long is it for each day? And is it suitable for just complete beginners? Well, for any listener, probably. Oh, great question. Yeah, so yeah, for sure. Um, fantastic question there, Lewis. Much appreciated. Um, is it suitable for beginners? Because a lot of our listeners may have never meditated before and or they might just be curious. Yeah. And how long is each day? And how yeah. long is it each day? No, good Thanks question because I actually overlooked that. Um, we have three different options. So you've got the silent sadhu, which is someone who's just 100%. You're doing the 10 hours a day. You're really dropping in. You're really focused. You've got the workplace warrior which is someone who's holding down a full-time job and we craft a schedule around that. So you can sit, don't quote me on this, five to six hours a day. So you're doing a couple hours in the morning plus an hour or so throughout the day. And then at night you're doing a few hours as well. Mm -hmm. So doing something is better than nothing. And then you've got the spiritual hustler as well, which is you're able to sit for four hours a day, two hours morning, two hours at night, drop in for the discourse for 45 minutes to really help you conceptualize and understand what you've been through. So. Anyone can step into this, no matter how big your workload is. It is best to just really be able to drop into that full 10 days though. Sure. What was your other question? Um, could a beginner, is it, is it accessible for beginners? I am the epiphany of that, epitome of that. Um, what did you call it? The, the Vapasana or? <laughs> Vapasana, yeah. Vapasana. I, yeah, Vapasana. I was um, <laughs> meditating for 20 minutes every second or third day. Yeah. And I've been in the gym for a long time, like eight, nine years. I really neglected stretching. Trust me, when I sit cross-legged, like my knees are up here. Um, and you'll see 70 year old people in there sitting for the 10 days. You're like, oh shit, okay, maybe I can do this. Um, so yeah. So zero excuses. Basically the bottom line is that it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter whether you've got the flexibility of a scaffold pole, you can yeah. still sit there, you can do it. It might be unpleasant, but you'll get some benefits. Yeah. And on the other side of that is a completely new life for yourself. That's mm. how I would put it. And Dave is a super genius. I think we need to kind of uh, put that out there. He's yeah. like Professor X. No, can we call him Dave X? Do you reckon that we can catch that one on? Do you yeah. think he'd appreciate yeah, that? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, see was, the sticks. He's going to punch me next time he sees me. Yeah, Dave X, that's what we're going with. But um, legitimate super genius. Um, mm. And what you said about his teachings and the way he brings things out of the ether, makes it real world, makes it applicable to business, real life and relationships, completely changes the game. So yeah, it's huge, huge value there. Yeah. I think it's an amazing point to end on. I think it's fucking amazing. Um, I th I'd love for people to know where they can find you, where they can find out a bit more about what you do and how you can help people in the world as well. Mm. I hang people. out mainly on Instagram, man. Yeah. Uh, M-I-K-E-L-E dot K. -E -E yeah. um, <clears throat> what I'm up to right now, man, is relaunching um, a passion project I had when I first got to Bali. It was called The Project, and it's a space for men to feel safe 
to have the conversations they wouldn't normally have with their friendship groups. I've really taken it for granted in my life. I've had some fucking solid friends with me that I've been able to open up, cry with and go through some shit and also call me out on my shit. I know a lot of guys don't have that. They have the friendship group where they know what they want more. They, they think differently to their friends, but they're not really sure what to do it. So I support in a one-on-one -on -one online intensive 12 week program with that. Love that. Um, it's something I fucking love doing. I, I, I started off uh, as a podcast when I first got here and it's evolved over time. And I think it's exactly what the world needs uh, without being like, I'm gonna change the world. But when you truly look at men and the narrative that everyone is champion, it's just, it's not working. Like in Australia, especially men are four times more likely to commit suicide than women. It's crazy. Um, it's, it's a big thing over there. Yeah. yeah. Same so, in the UK, man. Same thing. Men yeah. everywhere. But we, we all have that same conditioning. We're not meant to talk about our feelings. We're not meant to cry. We're not meant to go through stuff. Yeah. And, and you bottle it up. That's the thing, man. Like, I love that we can sit down and have a beer and go a bit deeper. But I feel like a lot of times with men, there's a bit of shame and guilt wrapped around that the next day. Oh, you might need five, one, two, five, ten, fifteen 10, 15 beers to really open up to your best friend. I've been in that state where I've had 20 beers and how much 20 15 beers um with a friend and just told him i loved him and i've been going through all this shit and he's always been my boy and the next day i see him at coffee we never touch that topic again it's like it's great that you can go there but like let's take that conversation there when you're sober and you don't need an external st stimulus to get there and then that becomes the normal in your life so that's something i fucking love doing man yeah um i love you just to touch on what's on the other side of that when men do open up and when they do go to that space in a conscious way mm. tell people about the power of that Life opens up. Life genuinely fucking opens up for you. Um, when you are able to really know who you are and share your passions without shame and guilt around that, uh, things will get offered to you. I sat across the table at Dave, who was about to start Yogi Lab, and shared with him what I fucking wanna do in life, what I'm really excited about, like the videos I wanna make, the content I want. I, I wanna create content that really like gives people permission to think differently in whatever they wanna do. I didn't know who I was speaking to. I just shared that. And when you when you know yourself and you're proud of who you are, people around you will start to notice and realize that and you'll get called forward into bigger and better roles in life. Where, no matter what that's in is, sporting, relationships, personal, finance, business, all of, those things, all of those things show up, man, when you really get to know yourself and love yourself. Cool. That is a mic drop moment, I think, right there, Raquel. Uh, <laughs> I love that. So yeah, once again, Give out your Instagram, let people know where they can find you. That was amazing. Cool. Mikel.k. Yeah. M I K E L E dot K on Instagram. Um, check me out. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thanks cool. for coming in, bro. Awesome. Thank Sick. you, bro. This is the Platinum Podcast. Podcast.